All right, guys, I'm Logan. I'm the garden manager out here at Juniper Level. Um, and today we're just gonna be looking at some spring bloomers in the garden. Uh, my primary focus is on native plants, but we're gonna talk about all sorts of things that are cool and blooming out here today. Um, so we're just gonna start right over here, actually. So the first one I want to start with is this cool little orchid right here. This is Pagonia ophioglossoides, also known as the rose pagonia or the adder mouth orchid. Uh, it's native to much of the east coast and found primarily in boggy wetlands um, up and down all the way up into Canada. Um, but that's why it's right at home here in one of our bog gardens. Um, really beautiful flower and a, a cool bottom lip on it if you take a look down in there. That's why they call it the adder's mouth orchid. It kind of, they say it looks like a snake tongue. I don't really see that resemblance, but it's really beautiful if anyone wants to get down there and take a look at it. It does look like a snake's tongue. <laughs> <laughs> The next one I want to talk about is our pitcher plants. They're, they're in full bloom right now. They are quite the treat to look at. Uh, they're some of my favorite flowers. I think they kind of look like a moon pie or something. Um, but they have a really cool floral morphology that I wanted to talk about. So if you look under here, you have this kind of pouch under the subtends the flower, and that acts as kind of an umbrella. The actual flowering bits are inside this pouch and they collect the pollen from the flower. All the anthers and stuff are up inside and the drops down into the umbrella. So when a pollinator goes in there, they roll around in the pollen and when they exit, hopefully they go over the stigma, which is this little nub. It's the female receptacle for the plant. And if you come and take a closer look, it's just a tiny little nub. So hopefully your pollinator rolls around in the pollen and then when it exits, it goes over the stigma too. So we're gonna keep on going this way. Yeah. We're gonna cut up this path right here. So we're kind of catching this guy on the tail end of its bloom, but if you go up to the, the White House Shade Garden, you'll see it in full bloom. This is Solomon's Plume. It's a native to Eastern North America. Its scientific name is Mayanthemum racemosum. Um, I wanted to point this out because we'll also be looking at some Solomon seal later. So some people will get these confused because they have a very similar habit as far as an arching and uh, opposite leaves like that. Um, but it's a beautiful white plume on these. This is actually starting to go to seed already. Um, but if you are walking through the rest of the gardens today, keep an eye out for this guy. And later on, I'll show you Solomon's seal, which is a totally different genus, but a similar look to them. So we'll keep on walking this way. I got a really cool one over here for you. So we're looking at this plant right here. This is known as Frasera carolinensis, also known as American Columbo. We've been growing this plant for six years now, and this is the only time it's ever bloomed for us, and will only bloom once in its life. So you hit it at just the right time. Um, it is a member of the gentian family. Some call, let's call it yellow gentian, but please come and take a closer look at these flowers. They're quite beautiful. I know they're kind of green, but they have some speckles of purple and some really cool thing, or just a really cool look. They almost look like a passion flower to me, uh, but they're not in the same family or anything like that. Um, just a really, I've had some visitors say this almost looks like a tobacco plant or something growing in the garden, but. It only once in a lifetime or mm -hmm. once every few years? Once in its life. So we've been growing this from seed for over six years now, and it's decided to bloom for us this year. Mm -hmm. The North Carolina Botanic Garden's also growing it, and theirs bloomed this year as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it takes a long time to build up that energy. I don't know if you were around when I was talking about agaves earlier, but a similar thing. So agaves will bloom once in their lifetime and then die. The rosette that blooms will die. Very similar here. Hopefully we'll get some seed set off of this so we can grow more from seed. And uh, another six or so years, we might see it bloom again. But please take your time and enjoy this one today because you won't see it again for a while. Uh, it is native to the eastern 
seaboard. Uh, goes all the way up into Michigan, I believe, maybe in a little further north. Is it fragrant? It's not very fragrant. Um, it's just a really cool flower. Um, and I just think it's pretty unique because I've never seen it bloom before, and I, I doubt any of you guys would see it uh, anytime soon. But you can see a, a honeybee up there, and I've seen a bunch of bumblebees on it this week. What color will the flowers eventually be? Uh, that's, as, that's as colorful as they get. They're kind of a greenish color, but they do have some speckling of purple on the inside, too. What do you call this plant? This is American Columbo. Um, the, the uh, a scientific name is Frasera carolinensis. We're going to keep on heading this way. Oh, that's pretty. It is. I'll, I'll kind of climb up in the bed and y'all can. Oh, but. So we talked about Solomon's plume, but y'all might be more familiar with Solomon's seal. This is Polygonatum biflorum. This is a native species to woodlands up and down the east coast. Uh, and you have these pendant flowers beneath the stem. Uh, very different from the plume at the end of our uh, Solomon's plume. The flowers on this are actually edible if anyone's brave enough to try one today. Yes. Kind of tastes like a sweet pea. I would. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh, don't want to destroy the plant. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Okay. I can't. Ooh. I'll get you another one. I just don't want to totally deflower it. Is it deer resistant or do deer like it? I've never seen a deer munch on it, but. Um, yeah. I'm I'm not too sure to be totally honest okay, with you. That's okay. um, Thank you. No problem. Yeah, yeah this one's yeah. going to be better tasting. Solomon's plume. That's Solomon's seal. Solomon's, Solomon's plume is the one we looked at earlier. Okay. Okay. Let's uh kind of work our way back around this way. We're going to head over to the patio behind the house over here. Excuse me, guys. Ooh, that water sounds so good. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Nice. Oh, this is beautiful. Gosh, yeah. What is that? It's not an evergreen, is it? It's not an evergreen, no. It's so how, who here is familiar with our native sweet Betsy bush? No. Beautiful. Calicanthus, the genus. Pretty sweet smelling usually. This is a hybrid with the West Coast uh, native calicanthus and the Chinese calicanthus. This is a product of NC State's Tom Rainey over at the Mountain Hort Research Station in Asheville. We call this one calicanthus aphrodite. Uh, it puts on a real show right now, as you can tell. Um, one of the most beautiful flowers this time of year, I think. Can you keep it cut back? Um, or no? It it likes, it's more of a large shrub to small tree. Okay. But you see all these canes on it, yeah. it does die back and go deciduous during the winter. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, but I've seen people grow this in Asheville and it's it's totally fine up there okay. too. So it'll, it's totally cold hardy, um, but just a really beautiful tree. So next we're going to cut through by the waterfall. Oh, that's pretty too. These little like bowl shaped flowers oh, no, are so yeah. pretty. Looks like little shoes yeah. or something. Oh, you, like you're spot like, on. They're called lady slippers. Oh, God, oh, look at yeah. that. That's so oh, wow. cute. Yeah, that's so pretty cool. Cute. It is. 
So we do have several, this is Cypripedium. This is a hybrid called Dietrich. Uh, it looks like a, possibly a hybrid of our native Parviflorum or uh, Kentuckiensis, but I'm not 100% sure on this one. Um, but Cypripedium is the genus of lady slipper orchids. There's a lot of them blooming in the garden right now, so keep your eyes out. Um, these two have a really cool uh, pollination biology. So I've had a lot of people ask me recently if these are carnivorous plants. They are not. They do kind of look like they have a trap on them though. Yeah. And this inflated petal known as the, uh, uh, the lip of the, the orchid uh, does kind of act like a trap. It has a lip on the inside of it. So any bee or pollinator that climbs down in there cannot exit through the top where they came in. Mm. So they get a little trapped in there. And the only way out is this little exit vent on the side. Mm. And that forces them to go over the anthers and collect pollen. Mm. So very similar to our Saracenia that we saw earlier, and that is forcing that pollination. Um, these can be self-pollinated. Um, and they're just really fun. I think they're some of the coolest orchids in the garden right now. Are they for shade only? They are for shade only. They're pretty peculiar to grow. Uh, they, we do have some for sale, but uh, mm. they are for an experienced gardener or, okay. or somebody that likes to gamble. So, <laughs> um, so we're going to cut across this bridge and then back up and out. But please take a look at these and try to look find the exit vent on the back. So the next plant we're going to look at is right up here on the left. This is another one of my favorites. This is mountain laurel, Calmia latifolia. This is a native species throughout much of the East Coast, but this particular one is a cultivar. In the wild, they're much more white to a pink color. Um, but again, this one has a really cool pollination biology. This is a member of the blueberry or heath family, believe it or not. It's related rhododendron and things like that. Um, but if you come take a look, A, you have these really geometric buds that are really beautiful and quite, quite striking. But if you look on the bottom of the flower, they have these little nubs. Those hold the anthers back like a spring. So when a bee lands here, all the anthers will shoot back and release their pollen. If I can get one to kind of work with me here. Did you guys see the little spring mechanism there? So when a bee wades down and lands on it, all the anthers fly and hopefully covers the bee in pollen. But let's see if I can get another one to go here. They can be a little tricky sometimes, but they're all just spring loaded back into these little nubs on the bottom of the flower. So please come take a look at this one too. It's a quite a beautiful one. Is that an evergreen? Tour? It is an evergreen. Okay. An evergreen. These can be pretty finicky to grow in our climate, the triangle. They like it a little cooler and less humid. Um, but oh. we've had success growing them in the shade, more shady, sheltered areas. Oh, shady. Yeah. That, they can't do half sun. Uh, they can do a little bit of sun. This is a pretty sunny area. Okay. You know, the cacti and the, the palms um, alive in the winter. So everything's a little different. We do a lot of trialing for cold hardiness. That's a big part of what we do out here um, is testing plants. Tony's killed over 50,000 plants in his quest to figure out what will grow here so you guys don't have to kill them. Uh, a big trick to our survival of cacti and succulent things are the, is the substrate we grow them in. First, we burn them kind of in a sloped shape and we fill it with a product called Permatil, which is a puffed slate product. It's little pieces of slate that are heated up really hot and puffed up like a Cheeto. So it's, it's aerated, it uh, adds a lot of drainage to the soil, and it also traps heat as well. So we mix that at a one-to-one -one ratio with composted soil, and that allows us to grow a lot of cacti, agaves, and things that just get a little too wet and soggy during our winter. Some of them still get kind of stressed out during the winter, but we'll trim them back and keep them going. Um, cold hardiness usually isn't too big of an issue with uh, most of those though. But we do a lot of trialing to figure out which ones uh, will survive. Thank you. We have a few more to check out over here. So this is going to be kind of a tight squeeze. We're going to try to thread ourselves through here and check out the bog. Oh. 
So we have two pretty cool plants. This is Allium alitacum from uh, Asiatic Russia, Turkey region of the world. We call this one bonehead. It's relative chives, garlic, onions, but look how thick and inflated the stem is before it gets to the flowering head. It's uh, pretty cool. We also have this really cool marshalia over here too. Um, this is a native to much of the East Coast as well. Um, marshalia, I always butcher this epithet on this, but caspitosa. Uh, we actually are offering this one for sale this year, but a really lovely aster uh, buttony flower to check out there. It does prefer slightly moister soils, but not too picky in the garden. And I think this is one of the more lovely bogs on the property, so please check out all the cool pitcher plants and whatnot growing on in here. I've got one more plant for us that I accidentally forgot to do at the beginning, but I promise you it will uh, raise a stink, hopefully. I also want to take a second to point out this really cool Baptisia. This is Baptisia perfoliata from the southeast. Uh, perfoliata referring to the perfoliate leaves, meaning the leaves wrap all the way around the stem. It has a very similar look to eucalyptus. This is a member of the pea family. Uh, its common name would be cat bells. You see each node has a single pea flower on it. And when that goes to seed, it forms one single pea pod. And when these dry out in the fall, all those peas kind of rattle around in their pods. So when you're walking through the pine scrub, it might sound like cat bells jingling when you're walking through these. But this is a really fun native, a uh, great texture plant for your garden. That's uh, called cat bells or Baptisia perfoliata. Is that evergreen? It is not evergreen, but it has a, a great winter interest if you let it dry. It almost looks like eucalyptus or something. So, so I think this is actually one of the stinkiest members in the entire garden. This is a vague relative of the corpse flower that most of you are probably familiar with. Um, but this is a totally different genus. This is Sarumatum, the sp specific species of Sarumatum venosum. This is native to North Africa, the Mediterranean. Um, but look at this spathe on this thing. It is insane, very speckled and for such a smelly plant, it is quite beautiful. Um, it actually produces its own heat like many of the aeroids to really emit that smell as far as it can. When I was coming in yesterday, I could smell it in the parking lot before I even got up to the house. Um, but it's producing this stinky scent to attract as many flies and gnats and things as it can because it's mimicking dead flesh, rotting food uh, for its pollinators. Um, so like many of the aeroids, it has its spathe and then these spadix. Um, and on the spadex you have two, you have male and female flowers, so uh, very funky smelling. If anyone's brave enough, uh, please walk carefully and stick your nose in there, but it's... Uh, something from here, it might... It, if you th think you might have stepped in something, something it's, yeah. it's probably that. And you said it's called what? Sarumatum venosum. Do deer, does it keep deer away? Um, I, I can't imagine they like the smell of that, but I've, I've never seen a munch on these guys, put it that way. Um, but that's all I got for you this morning. So if you guys have any questions, please, I'm happy to take a minute and answer them for you. Thank you for joining along and listening to me run my mouth for a few minutes. Yeah, thank you.